Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome on into the studio. I'm Jessica Putnam Phillips, and this is Clay Share Live. And there's only 10 days to Christmas. I can hardly even stand it. I'm so excited. Uh, tonight we're going to do a using underglaze on texture tutorial. So I've been sharing pieces I made over the last week that came out of the kiln on last Sunday in our kiln opening. If you want to check that out, you can do so on ClayShare.com or just download the ClayShare app and it'll make your life so much easier. You can watch it there. And I shared them and talked about the glazing that I did, but I didn't show it. So I thought what we would do is I would show how I use the underglazes, talk about the different colors of underglazes and testing them out, show some different textures that I have with finished pieces on it to give you good examples to start with, and actually put some underglaze on pieces and show you how I do it myself. It's very exciting stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> so let's get started. Um, now, tonight is December 15th, and many of you might be thinking, mm, but I thought tonight was the night we were going to announce the recipients of the Clay Share Veteran Scholarship. It was. We have pushed that back a week till next Wednesday because we were inundated with so many applications, and I really want to give everybody equal time to be considered. and these are very hard to read. You know, you read people's stories about, you know, what they went through and what they experienced. And as a veteran myself, and Kevin's also a veteran, we know firsthand exactly what that experience is like. So for us, when we're reading these, it can bring back a lot of memories and it can be very difficult and emotional for the two of us to read. So it's not a dispassionate, like, um, cold thing for us to read these. We feel it deeply. So it takes us a little longer than maybe if we just ask some random person to read them. And we would never do that because we really want to make these decisions with our heart and our soul. So we're going to announce those recipients next Wednesday, which is going to give us just uh, another week to go through them. I thought I could go through them faster, but I find after only reading like four or five of them, I am emotionally at the end. So please, if you've applied, um, please just understand, we really want to give you all 100% of us, so it's going to take a little longer. So that'll be next week. So I put this together pretty quickly, realizing there was no way I could have them all done, and we're going to do this tonight. And it's going to be fun, and everybody's going to enjoy it. So, all right, so let's see what's going down with everybody. Everybody's tuning in and watching with people in Australia. We got, fo fo oh, where are you? Screen is blurry, or is it just you? It might be you. Got folks from the Netherlands, London, Ontario's in the house, North Wales is here. So, yeehaw, you guys. All right, so let's get started. What is underglaze? We'll start with the basics. Underglaze is exactly what you think it is. It's a product that's meant to go under glazes. So I use a couple different ones in my studio. Speedball is my go-to. I've been working with them for quite a few years. What I love about Speedball is they're affordable and they have really good color payoff for what you get in their containers. Now they recently changed their bottles. They used to have these tiny little tops that were just terrible to work with. Now we have these great big wide mouth jars, which make it really easy to get our brushes in and out of them, which I do love. Now I use my underglazes watered down like watercolor. I rarely will actually brush the underglaze on full strength to just get a big solid bit of color. If I want that, I'm probably gonna go for a glaze. But what I like about underglazes is you can brush them on texture and then wipe back, or you can use them, like I said, a watercolor wash, or you can use them on bisqueware as a watercolor and paint on the surface to give you a beautiful watercolor effect. And for me, you know, Speedball has been the one that I've used the most, like I mentioned, but Mako has great ones, Amico has some as well. So when you get your underglazes, which this is like a slip with color, so it's basically think of it as a clay a white colored clay that they've added a colorant to. And this color doesn't flux, it doesn't melt, it doesn't run like a glaze. It's very stable, it's gonna stay where you put it. So unlike a product like Stroke and Coat from Mako or like a Celadon glaze, those might melt a little bit, but your underglaze isn't moving at all. Your underglaze is gonna stay put where you put it, which is why I like it for doing detail work for color. Because I think if we go to the overhead, I can show you I did a different color in each one of these areas, and you know it didn't move around. It didn't scooch away. It stayed where it was supposed to, just like I did on this plate here. 
so the stripes don't bleed into the next stripe. So it stays. Glazes can be a little tricky. Sometimes we want them melting, and that's not a bad thing, but sometimes you don't. So when I first get my, my underglaze, and Speedball's underglazes are non-toxic. They're food safe. They can go from cone 05 to cone 10. So they have a wide range. They can go on any clay body you want to use. So 05 to cone 10, any clay you want to use. And then I usually put clear glazes or celadon or slightly tinted glazes over them so you can still see the color underneath. I do advise zinc-free glazes. We talked about that last week a bit because zinc can sometimes eat away or alter the color of your underglaze. All right, so when you first get your underglazes, what you're gonna wanna do is make some sort of test piece. And that could be in the form of test tiles. You could do a whole bunch of little tiles, or you can make yourself a test plate. And that's usually what I do. And I do have tutorials on making this exact plate on Clayshare. It's just a scalloped rimmed plate. Um, this is like my go-to plate form right here. And you can see it from the back. So you can see the scallops on it. But I love this for so many reasons. It's great for doing the tests on. It's great for just making a lovely dinnerware set out of. So if you are just learning how to make plates or making pottery, making this and meaning it to be a test plate is a good starting point because if you mess it up, it's just a test plate. So you don't have to worry about it being a fancy dinnerware piece. It can just be the test plate. And I have about six of these floating around the studio. So if you mess up a lot, just put them to the side and save them. So meaning by messed up, you get cracks, little micro cracks. Um, I don't have any on these, but sometimes you get cracks on the rim or maybe cracks on the feet. As long as the plate itself is intact and not broken, it's a great thing to use as a test piece. And then I divide each one of these little scalloped sections up into uh, an area for me to apply my underglaze. And I apply one coat, two coat, three coats, so I can see how opaque it is and how much color builds up. A lot of times the one coat is what I'm most interested in because I, like I mentioned, do watercolor. But it's nice to see how it will look at its thickest too. And also, I put a clear glaze on top of my test plate, whatever clear glaze I plan to use, so I can see how that clear glaze will react with my underglaze. So let me hold this up for the overhead. You guys can see that there. So this was Speedball Underglazes fired to cone five with clear 2167. That's the clear I use in the studio. And so you can see it's a little dusty. Let me, let me clean it. It's, it's kind of part of this pottery studio, right? Things get dusty. Um, and so you can see how the color looks on here. Also what I love about this is it makes a color wheel. And I first saw these when I was in uh, Sevres in France, just outside of Paris. I was at the Sevres porcelain um, factory and they had a bunch of these there and I wanted to take them home, but sadly you cannot take them home. But it gave me the idea to make these for my own studio use as a plate. And I put a hanger on the back so these can just hang on my wall. I don't have to worry about taking up a shelf, right? And then I have a visual, it just hangs. It's just gonna hang right here. And actually I do plan to put these on the wall. I just have not got there yet in my free time, but I'll probably put them up a little higher. <laughs> but they're great for that. So this, having all my colors right here, I can pick, well, I wanna do something in blues and greens, okay? Here's my blues to my greens right there. So I know I can pick colors and see how they look next to each other. And then maybe I wanna pull in a yellow. Which yellow do I wanna pull in? Right, and this happens to be Speedball's colors. This is Amico's. I had so many Amico colors that I did two plates. I did one with warm colors in the black and white are on there too because I want to see how they look. And I did one with cool colors. So I can see how Amico's underglazes look. And these also were fired to cone five with the 2167 clear. And the clay is B-Mix. So it's the clay I normally use. If you use another clay, then I suggest you use a plate for that other clay. It just, it just makes sense, right? Don't use a clay, don't go get a clay just to make test plates out of that you're not gonna make pots out of. Use the clay that you're gonna make your pots out of. Not, don't buy porcelain clay and make your test plates out of porcelain and then use Laguna 60 to make all your pots. 
your test plates will be useless. You need to make them out of the clay you use in the studio. So now I have great references for color. All right, so this is all the leading up to how we pick color, right? And we have our little guides, so now I know exactly what I'm going to use for my colors. And then I look at my designs and I decide from that. I love, obviously, blues and greens. It's sort of apparent here. And that's why I go with them the most. But whatever colors you like, you know, if you like black and white, we should, we should do a black and white one. Black and white is great because it does, you could put, all right, do it black and then clear for black and white. But if you want to do black, oh my gosh, this black under glaze with a light blue, this is the wave texture. I, I think I'm going to have to do that. Or you could do a deep, dark blue, right? And oftentimes when you buy, let me grab this. So when you buy your underglazes and you're looking at them in your bottles, let me just grab my royal blue. Hold on, let me grab that one. Here. Okay. So here's my royal blue. And why it's really important to do a test piece before you actually make something with it is this. Look at that blue. Whoa, that's a bright blue, right? And you're thinking, oh, that's too bright. Well, here it is fired. So I just brushed it on so you can see the difference. This is wet, this is fired. So it's not this color. Fired, it goes a dark, dark cobalt blue. So if you wanted that bright color, you want to look somewhere else because that's not going to get it for you. Actually, medium blue, which I don't have on here, will give you this bright blue color. Speedball came out with 12 new colors last year, and so I have two color wheels of theirs. I didn't grab my other one, but okay. So what clear glaze did I use? That is my, it's clear 2167, and the recipe is up on claysharesources.com. It's a very simple cone five zinc-free glaze, and it's um, one of my go-tos. So let me show you some finished pieces that I've done using under glaze for texture. This one just came out of the kiln. Here it is, just a piece of lace I pressed into the clay, made this really great bowl, and then I highlighted it using underglaze. Pretty simple, right? Now I showed these already, same thing, brushed on the underglaze. Very simple, wipe back. We're gonna do a couple of these together in just a minute. It's a very fast technique to get a lot of color. So if you're looking for a way to, to do fun color, this could be it. Here's that lace on a mug. And actually, I'll show you the lace. Let me show you. I've got the lace right here that I used. So this is the lace I used on this mug right here. You can see if we line it up, that's the lace. You press it in on your slab, and then you roll up and you make your mug. This one, I even, even got lace on my handle. Fancy, fancy. And then you highlight your texture. Now, this lace is just some Battenberg lace. This lace here was sent to me by one of our Clayshare members. Um, Lori sent it to me. It belonged to her grandmother. And I'm so inspired by it, I've reached out to Lori and asked her permission if I could turn this into a rolling pin because it is probably the most sumptuous, beautiful lace I have ever had the pleasure of working with. It is just to die for. It's gorgeous. And that's what I pressed on these plates here. And then you can see it. Here it is. And we'll talk about those glazes in a second. Here's some more of it. <laughs> I, I told you I got carried away. Look at this one. Isn't that lovely? It's just a piece of art. It really is. And I'm so thankful she sent it to me. Here's a big tray. I put this up today showing this tray, how I did it in a quick little tutorial. And then here's a really lovely sectioned tray right here. So hopefully Lori will get back to me. I want her permission before I go ahead and do it. This belonged to her grandmother. It's a personal item she sent to me, and I don't feel that um, it would be right or respectful for me to just go ahead and make it and put it out there for you all to get. So we'll see what Lori says. Um, so another one that's really fun, make a bread plate. We actually made bread plates in a live prime time a year or so ago, and I love this. It's a piece of lace that says bread on it, as you can see on my 
bread plate, but here it is. Here's the lace that I, that I got, and it's really, really fun. And you can find these on eBay. You can find them on Etsy. You can find them at yard sales, tag sales. Maybe you have lace that belongs to somebody in your family that you can use. And what a great way to make a memento using their lace. So here's another one I picked up that I haven't even used yet. It's so cute. It is a little Scotty dog, and it says dog on it. Let me move this out of the way, and I can drape it on the... But, you know, I have Yorkies, and Yorkies and Scotties are similar a little bit, so I'm going to um, color it like my little Yorkie boy. Um, Turn it into a rolling pin. You love the lace. I love the lace, too. So what's going on? I'm going to ask you to stay on the overhead. Stay on the overhead. I'm sorry it's going to shake everyone. Hold on, everybody. We're having a technical issue with a camera that I'm trying to show. All right, you fix. You out. fix. Oh, my gosh. That was pretty shaky. So here's one we're going to do the, do the texture on with that, that lace. Everybody just close your eyes for a sec. It's shaking so bad. Um, and then this is the underglazes with clear glaze on it. Wow. I know we should almost be like, please stand by. I have to, I have to hold the overhead camera. Yeah, you should. It's all right, folks. Just hang on. <laughs> uh, how do we do gift certificates for Clayshare? I will see. I will ask Kevin and see if he can do that for everybody. Right. So Clayshare. Right, okay, we're, pl we're good. So here, here it is with just clear, right? Here it is with aqua celadon. So you can see the difference. The aqua celadon just gives a background color to it of a, an aqua color, which is really nice. Here it is with my chun blue. Wow. You need to walk soft. Here it is with Chun Blue. Here it is with Fog. I really like it with Fog. It, um, what I like the most about Fog, and I'll show you it with Ice. This is Ice. This is Fog. What I like about the Fog over the Ice is the area where there's not a lot of texture is too light. I wish they were darker. This, the Fog's a darker glaze. Now these are all Amico Celadons. So they're good options for using when we do color like this. All right, we're going to scooch this all out of the way. We've got a lot of stuff. So let's get going and make some stuff. Let's start with one of these right here, one of those sectional trays. And I'll wait for Kevin to leave the camera before I go into the tutorial because I don't want it shaking while I do it. So we'll wait for him to be done and leave. <laughs> wait for him to go. So the colors that I'm going to use... We'll pick our colors, and that's what I do first. Think about what I like. We know what I like, blues and greens. So that would be aqua, teal, sea blue, turquoise. These are my, my three, four, well, these are my aqua, teal, sea blue are my three. And then I'll put in turquoise, and then I'll put in that medium blue if I want another blue to give me five colors. We're on one. Are we on? Okay. Yeah, I just need to get okay, it. we're going to get this one. So you had a Scotty named Wesley Leslie. So cute. My Yorkie's is Levi, but he doesn't have a, he doesn't have a middle name yet. i got to get him a, a middle name. All right, let's get our colors. So I'm going to do aqua. Grab that out. And we'll do one in blues and greens, and I'll do one with a black because I know everybody loves black. And then we'll do some with warm tones so that we got three happening. Now, teal. So I've got aqua and teal. And then I need my turquoise, which is down here, and my sea blue. And this is what I was talking about, the old style, the old style jars. And I don't think I have turquoise in the new jar. No. So the old jars had these teeny little tops, which are horrible to work with because you can't get brushes down in. Now, I usually just pour it out into another jar and thin it down. But... Dizzy, I know, Sharon. I'm so sorry for that. For some reason, one of our cameras has started acting up, and it's not an old camera. All right, so we're going to put this down here. I'm going to grab a few containers. These are just little disposable. Um, 
meow mix containers. They're cat food containers, but um, you can save yogurt containers. You can work on those little pla plastic pallets, but they don't hold enough for me. I found that I need more material. I need more underglaze than will, that will hold. And I'm gonna make some space here. Normally my work area is not covered up in pots. Sometimes it happens. So we, I see some folks, you can't find the broadcast on Facebook. It is here, but um, hi everybody watching on YouTube. I'm glad you guys are there. YouTube can be one of the best ways to watch if you don't want to watch on the Clayshare app. You know, and while you're on YouTube, you can check out all my other YouTube videos that I've done. I was doing YouTube back in, oh my gosh, 2012. I've been doing YouTube for a while. <laughs> but I have to say I'm not a YouTuber, YouTuber or a regular YouTube poster. I'm, I used to keep up with it more, but with running Clayshare, that's really got all my focus. So this is the sea blue. This is the turquoise. And you see how thin they are coming out of the bottle? That's because I've already thinned them down. Like I mentioned, I work mostly with my underglazes as watercolors. So I made the decision to thin them all down. But you might not want to do that. You might want to just thin down a tiny bit and then keep that in a separate container instead of thinning down your whole big container. Your cat's middle names are Cat, like Bella Cat. Clickman. Oh, I love it. So it'd be Levi Dog Putnam Phillips. It'd be Levi Yorkie <laughs> Putnam Phillips. <laughs> right now he's the floof because he's a fluffy little thing. <laughs> All right, so we've got three colors and I am going to grab not the royal blue. I am going to put this away. That royal blue is great, but it's a really dark contrast to the other colors that I'm going to be using tonight. So I'm going to go with the medium blue, which is a brighter blue. And I can just show you on this plate. Are you on the overhead, hon? Yeah. Okay. This is medium blue right here. So it's a nice bright blue. It's a really, it's a really pretty blue. And I do go to it a lot. He fixed the main camera. Yay! That's why we keep them around. All right, so set up your work area. Get your all, all your colors you're going to be working with. And then I buy these brushes. They're called Sumi, S-U-M-I. They're also called uh, bamboo handled brushes. Sometimes they're referred to as Japanese or Chinese calligraphy brushes. Um, and they're really great because they're not very expensive and they hold a lot of color especially a lot of watered down color. So I like to get, I buy these in packs of 100, don't judge. I just need a lot of brushes in my life. Um, so what I'll do is I'll get a brush for each color so I don't have to worry about not having a brush or cleaning a brush out in between. I don't wanna do that. I wanna just have one brush. And you know, you can make yourself a little brush rest to go next to them so that they uh, don't roll around. All right, so I'm just going to put a little water in some of these because I noticed they're thick. And then we'll start. And honestly, it can be any color you want to start with. This is the sea blue down here. So I'm going to make the sea blue these little leaves right here. And so I'm just going to go in and paint the sea blue wherever those little leaves live. And then also I think I'm going to make the stems sea blue. And so this lace... That, that Lori sent to me, that was her grams, has a beautiful floral pattern to it. So we've got lots of leaves, we've got some scrolling elements and vines and things. So there's, there's, you can almost paint a picture with this. And so we'll start with this color. But you know, you could just blotch it on randomly. I promise it works. <laughs> like it's crazy, but it does, it works. We'll do one more over here. All right, so that's highlighting those parts. And if you miss something and you realize it later, you can easily go right back and fix it. And then this one was a turquoise, which is a, a lighter, lighter color. So I'm just gonna do a few things with the turquoise. Maybe the center of that there, the center of this one here. 
and then something down here just to have some around. And I might come back to more of that. And if you know um, you're going to reuse these cups a lot, which you probably would, write on the cup what color you plan to keep in them, and then you just grab them out when you're setting up to work. Just makes it much easier. All right, so this one is the teal, which is a stunning underglaze color. So I'm going to do that flower with teal. I'm going to do one down here. So you want to make a color wheel of your stroke and coats. Can you fire what you have now and add and refire? Um, you can. You, you could do that. I don't think that would be a problem. Sure, you could make it and then just keep firing your stroke and coats. Um, but just remember, every time you fire a piece, it becomes more brittle. So it could potentially crack on you. I wouldn't do it more than two or three times. Just because I think you're risking cracking. I'm going to put some on the edges of these leaves here. And that's the great thing is I can put more than one color in an element. So like this leaf can have more than one color. I can do the edges in this teal and then I could do the center in sea blue if I want to. Mm, what's that going to be? Mm, I'm not going to do teal on that one. Let's see this. Okay, so we got some more colors. We've got the aqua, which is a lighter color. Let's put that in the center of this right here. This is why I buy a hundred of them. Did you see that? It just fell apart. It, it just broke. It happens. It's not a big deal. Um, when you buy them a hundred at a time, they're, not, they're actually very affordable. And most teaching supply companies and um, catalogs will have them. So you can pick them up there. I think I got mine at Dick Blick. Um, there's also Teacher Supply usually carries them and stuff. So you can find them all over. So the aqua I'm dabbing in. And then you get to pick a color to be like your background color. Because you want something on the background. You don't want it to just be white. Right? You've got texture. You need to put something in there. And so I think I'm going to end up going with that blue. I want to put the turquoise in this right here, that flower there. All right, so all the flowers and stuff are covered, and now we're going to do the background. The teal is pretty. It really is. It's really pretty. And so we're going to do a blue background now. Don't worry if you overlap. The color that touches it first is the color that the clay is going to absorb. So if I overlap another color, it really, it just doesn't, it doesn't usually get through. You'll see when we wipe it all off. So normally what I'll have is not just one piece going. I put a video out a few days ago showing me doing this process right here. And I'll have six or seven pieces ready to go and I just go down the line and I use one color and I do all the things I'm going to do with that color and then I go back with the next color and the next and the next and that just makes it go much faster and also creates a really nice series because you've got this grouping of pieces you made that all have similar colors even if they don't have similar textures. Alright, so there we have it. Looks kind of cool like that, doesn't it? Just kind of a um, crazy splotchy thing. Here, I'm going to pull the Instagram folks down. There. So you guys can see right there. So then you let it dry, and then you wipe it off. And so you had a pinhole in a mug, and we fired it. Instead of melting it, dozens more appeared. You think it, you were light-handed with the brush on glaze. It could be, or sometimes glazes will pull away more when you refire it, Linda. Go ahead and do another coat of glaze and fire it again, and it should fix it. All right, so... We're waiting. Let's quickly do another, and let's do it a, a little different. We'll go in reverse order, and we'll start with that blue that I just put on. Let me put that one there. And we'll start with this blue, and we'll do that first. So that'll be our first color. Put the blue on the leaves. And this all will change if you use different glazes, right? So a super bright, intense glaze color you know, we'll hide our beautiful 
underglaze colors. So what you're going to want to do is definitely work with things that are translucent and um, more light, that are lighter. Let's do a little bit of sea blue. Put some over here, and again, I'm just going to do the sea blue for the vining areas. Now, if you use really crazy bright underglaze colors, you could go ahead and tone that down a lot by using something like that fog glaze, right? Because that's a grayish color, and that'll tone down the intensity. So that's good there. That's good there. I need to put something on that leaf over there, though. So let's grab this right here. Put some turquoise in there. And then for this one, I'm going to use the aqua for the background color. And so we'll just squish that all over. And you can be, you can be messy. I mean, this is, I love doing this. It's really fun when I put these up as tutorials, like as little fast videos. And I love all the comments that the people are like, well, that's too messy. And I'm like, uh, it's supposed to be messy. And it's very fun. So it's okay. It's okay to be messy sometimes. All right, now this one is sat. Usually, once I finish my last one, I'll go back and be able to wipe my first one. Hey, Christine, I see you. I see. <laughs> Saying hi to everybody. Well, we see your comments, hon. You made it. Lace done with Georgie. Oh, I know, with Georgie's Autumn Foliage and Sand and Surf. Mm hmm. You know, I want to do it with that, too. So let's just start wiping back. I took my bucket of water that I've been using. It's, it's tinted now because I've been rinsing my brush off in it, but that's fine. You squeeze your sponge out really, really well. And I will tell you, this is going to tear through sponges. So please use inexpensive sponges because you don't want to like use your really nice, fancy sponges for this. And then you just wipe back the underglaze. And you just Keep turning your sponge and wiping. And sometimes you'll actually spread your underglaze around a bit, which is what we want, because it just moves that color from one area to another. And so those of you who are joining in, I am using watered down underglaze, but you could use stroke and coat for the same technique. You could even use glazes, but the thing is, glazes are much more expensive than a bottle of underglaze. Like, speedball underglazes are the best for the budget, I think. But even though I can buy other glazes, you know, when I started as a student, I was very budget conscious, as we all often have to be and really should be. And I went with speedball. I was using some Amico, but for the price I was paying for Amico, I could get two jars of Speedball. That's a no-brainer, right? So then I started using Speedball, and then I got to meet the folks at Speedball, and they became a sponsor and sponsored me before I had Clayshare when I was just, you know, with, in my own artwork. And when I would do workshops, they would send cases of underglazes to my workshops so the folks could use them. And then when I left, the workshop, when it was over, I would leave the case of underglazes there for that clay center to use in their program. So it would benefit the students in my workshop, but also it would benefit that clay center after I was gone. And I did that, and I, when I use Speedball underglazes, I still try to do that. And so Speedball has been great. I've toured their factory in North Carolina. I've met all the folks there. They're really wonderful. And they're just really great people. And I see there's a question on YouTube about what kind of water I'm using. This is just my regular old tap water. Could you use distilled if you wanted to? Sure. Do you need to? I don't think so. I don't think it makes a difference. So do you have to have the underglaze completely dry before you start wiping back? Well. No, but if it's not dried and absorbed into the piece, if you start wiping back too quickly, it'll be really easy to wipe away a lot of your color. And so then you'll be really dissatisfied because you'll get out 
you'll get pieces out of the kiln that are very bland, right? So I like to wait until it's dry. You don't have to if you're in a time crunch, but it'll give you better results. So look right here. I don't know if you can see, we've got two different blues and greens coming together and that's gonna be so pretty when it's finished. Use Amico Mixing Clear, sell it on top of under glazes. I do too, they, it, I've used it before. It works fine. Speedball has their own clear, which I, I like a lot. It's a really great clear glaze. And the thing is these can go cone 05 to cone 10. So Speedball has a low fire clear. They also have a stoneware temperature clear. So depending on what temperature you're firing to. They don't have a cone 10 clear though. So because this is a non-toxic product, I don't need to wear gloves. Um, you will see if you go back some videos of me wiping back under glazes wearing a glove. That's not because it was a toxic material. That's because I had ruptured the tendon in my hand, in my right hand a few years ago. And I had to wear a, a splint for a few months and I, I had to keep it dry. So that's the only reason you'll see me wearing that glove is not because it was toxic with this product. And you know, one reason why I like to use this when I teach workshops is because I'm leaving it behind at a clay center that might have children programs there. And I know this is safe for kids to work with. All right, so there we have it. Look at that, it's already gorgeous. Like it's already great. Um, I'm not gonna wipe this one back. You saw me wipe it back. I wanna get to something else. I got other things we wanna do. So what will I do now? Well, last week we did a glazing tutorial and we glazed our holiday platters and trays. I would glaze it the exact same way as I did that, except I would use maybe a clear or maybe I'd use a tinted celadon or my chun, which again, let me just show you. So we have got, this one is the fog. And then this is my chun, which has a little more blue to it. But it still shows that texture. And Jennifer Alara was commenting about the Georgie's. This with Georgie's Sand and Surf and my chun would be unbelievably awesome. All right, let's move on and do one with warm colors and then we'll do black last. See where we're at, gotta keep going. All right, I'm gonna wipe this clean. This is a piece that has been sitting on the shelf waiting to get bisque for about four or five months. This is one of my little strap slab bowls, strip slab bowls, I think I call it. It's just a quick little tutorial we have on Clay Share. Teach you how to make these. They're really fun. They're a great way to use up scrap clay and you can save these little strips. And you can make them huge, you can make these bowls big, you can make them little, whatever you wanna do. So I'm going to switch and we're going to use some warm colors. So I'm just rinsing my brushes off. I'm going to squeeze them out. I'm going to set these colors to the side. Now, I would not, I wouldn't have a problem pouring these little containers right back into my jars because like I said, I work with them thinned down always. But if you don't want to work with yours thinned down all the time, which you might not, you know, unless, if you don't know exactly how you're going to use your underglazes, you might not want to do that. So get some little containers that have lids or something, and then you could keep them in that. All right, so what do we got? We got peach, we got melon, which are about some of my absolute faves. The orange, the mandarin orange is crazy good. Carmine is great. Um, so all these, they have a lot of warm colors in the speedball line. So I'm going to go with peach. I'm going to go with mandarin orange. Definitely. They have, let's see, we got regular yellow. I'm grabbing melon and the yellow. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven strips. I think we should only do three colors. Three, three. Then we could be one, two, three. So these would be the same and that would be the same, which that will be leave the yellow off. Yeah, that works. That works for me at least. So I'm gonna grab some more little cups and we'll do the same thing again. 
Carmine with cherry blossom over celadon. Oh, cherry blossom celadon with carmine, huh? Well, I happen to have carmine, Jennifer. Let's do that. Carmine. So if I'm going to go with carmine, I might go with uh, pink. And then maybe, maybe melon too? Or peach? Ooh, tough choice, right? How about carmine, mandarin, orange, and peach? We'll do those. We'll do those. And I'll put my under other ones back. Okay. Always listening to what you all want and uh, taking into account your suggestions. So this one, look at how thick that is. That, that is too, that's too thick. <laughs> so we're definitely going to be adding a bunch of water to that. And that can happen very, very easily. They just, they just dry out. Um, as I mentioned, I don't use the warm colors hardly at all because I like the cool ones. So you'll notice the warm colors are not as thin down because I'm not using them. Except the peach, apparently. That's a little thinner. I like that one a lot. Okay. Um, the water I'm adding to it is just uh, a bottled water because this is the uh, clean, uncontaminated water I have in my studio. I don't have running water in my studio, so I just grab a bottle. And I'll just fill these up from my refrigerator in the house. So there's peach. If you add too much water, just add a little more underglaze to it. And then we'll put a little in the carmine. But these are, are really working lovely because sometimes when you add your water, they could be chalky, but these are mixing down nice and smooth, so they're not going chalky at all. How many coats of fog did I put on that piece? This was two good coats, two nice coats. And then I put a different, this is a Laguna Peacock on the back. So <laughs> I didn't use the same glaze front and back. Looks nice together though, doesn't it? Peacock and then the fog. So that's two good coats of it. Um, and that's usually enough. You could go with three if you want to. All right, I'm gonna move my color wheel off to the side and then we'll work on our slab strip piece. So we're gonna start with the carmine and we're just gonna Put that in. So this has seven strips, which works out really nice from a design standpoint because odd things or odd numbers are always more pleasing. I shouldn't say always. Usually odd numbers of things are more pleasing to the eye than even. But you know rules are meant to be broken, so sometimes you'll make something and it's got even number of things and it's you know really, really nice. So it just Absolutely depends on what you got going. Should I not add well water to my glazes? Um, so my, when I make glazes in my studio, I use water from my tap. Yes. Which is well water. Yeah, because people here in the city water don't tap water. Oh, yeah, I have well water. Um, I've always had well water. Uh, so I know city water adds things. So you might, that might, could, that might affect how your glazes turn out, right? But when I was in school, they used city water when we made, we made glazes at the university. And when I taught at the university, um, you know, anything we made, we used tap water. So I'm thinking this peach is going to be too light. We'll try it but it might be too light of a combo. But what really pulls these together is going to be the glaze I put on top. That's the thing that's going to make all the difference. All right, we've got this on. It's got to sit just a few minutes. So let's let this be, and let's do that black, because I know we want to see the black, right? I want to see the black. Let me grab my jar of black. And so we'll pour this out. See how thick the black is. Ooh, it's, it's chunky. <laughs> it's like my cat. It's chunky. 
So we're going to need a bit of black because we're covering this whole plate. Now, my black, I don't usually thin down because oftentimes this is one of the colors I'll use for scraffito. And you want it to be not too thin when you're applying it to a piece that you're going to carve. I mean, you could do a watercolor effect with it if you want to and then carve it. Sure. Um, these, I would say, this one here that I have in my hand, what size brush, this is a fat one. This would be more like a number 8 to 10. The other one was probably closer to a 6. So this one here is a, a big one. Okay. Now, we can put the plate on. Let's see how thick this is. So if you're brushing it on your texture and it's not going in the texture, you're like having to force it down in the texture, then your underglaze is too thick. Let's go ahead and add a little water. Thin it down a little bit. So Jennifer, you suggested that color combo for that piece, so if I don't like it, I'm sending it to you, just so you know. That's what happens. If you tell me to do something and I do it and I don't like it, you get it. <laughs> Now I'm going to get tons of requests. <laughs> so if you add stroke and coat, do you need to add water? If it's too thick, you want the consistency of like a thick ink. So yeah, you would want to thin it down even with stroke and coat because you need to get it to flow down in to those recessed areas. And so you just keep brushing it on. And like I said, if it's not getting in there, then obviously it's too thick. You just keep adding the water. And this seems like a lot of underglaze, but in fact, by watering it down, you're cutting it more than half, probably cutting it two-thirds water, one-third underglaze, sometimes a quarter underglaze, three-quarters water. So because you're cutting it down so much, I have bottles of underglaze you saw with the old tops. Um, I just don't go through it as fast. All right, so any area that I've missed, I'm just going to go back and put another coat just to get down in. Won't hurt anything. Okay, so we'll let that sit for a minute. And now we'll move on to that strap. We'll go back to that. Hit the room with seaweed over the cherry blossom. Ah, oh, listen to you. All right, I'll do that. <laughs> I'll do that. In the break between this broadcast and prime time, I'll do that. So let's go ahead. We squeeze this out just like we did before. And let's go ahead and wipe back. And I'm just going to start in the middle. So this middle texture is uh, my vintage geometric. The one right next to it is my lattice flourish before we did the redesign. So I made this one before we redesigned it. So you'll notice that it's not as large. The design's smaller and it's reversed in the new design. So it presses in instead of out, which I love. And then this next row is just some stamps that I made. Just some homemade stamps. And then the last strip is some lace. Lace is almost always in the studio showing up one way or another. So now I'm going to go back and just... You can choose to do two things, one of two things. You can apply more thicker layers of underglaze to the rims, or like Jennifer suggested, use seaweed on the rim, use a glaze on the rim. So since that's what I'm going to do, I'm going to scrub my rim clean. Because I'll glaze this and uh, it'll go on my next glaze firing. Which, I wasn't going to have another one before Christmas, but I just realized I have Christmas presents that have to be finished. 
So many of you are in the same boat as me. We've got 10 days till Christmas and we're trying to dry mugs faster than we should. Um, fairy houses, trying to dry those fast. I've got plates, trying to dry those. I've got some pendants that I made for my daughters and I'm trying to get those to dry. So we're, we're like down to the wire. I always say every year I'm gonna start my Christmas gift making um, like in September. No, that doesn't happen. Please raise your hand if you actually make the Christmas gifts and have them all done in September and don't have to make anything else for the rest of the season. You're like completely finished. I don't know if I'm seeing any hands. <laughs> all right, so that's wiped back with the warm colors. You'll have to wait to see what it looks like when it's glazed. So now, it does look like a sunset sky. I think it's gonna be beautiful. And we have a streakiness here. That's a personal uh, preference situation. So you can go in and you can really clean it out, right? If I do one side, I'm gonna balance it out by doing the other. And really scrub the color off that area, right? There's still some hiding in the recesses on the edges. So it's not gone, gone, but you choose how much you remove. Sometimes I'll leave a little more in there. Sometimes I'll take a little more away. It, it just, it really just depends on how I'm feeling. But there's no, you can't go wrong, really. Okay, that one we're gonna let be, and now we're gonna move to the black. <laughs> I, yeah, I didn't see anybody say they were done. Um, Many of us are, are trying to finish up. All right, for this, I'm just gonna start in the middle and work my way out with the black. Christmas should be our projects for the month of September, 2022. Maybe we will. Um, when I say my chun, what exactly does that mean? So I developed about 20 years go, ago, a chun glaze that was based on an ancient Song Dynasty Chinese glaze. That was also a chun glaze. And so through years of testing and development and refining and retesting, I came up with a chun blue glaze, which is a glaze that I used in my studio for many years. And then I think three years ago now, two years ago, I can't, I can't remember, um, Clayscapes Pottery and I started working together to bring that to the world. So you can buy my chun blue glaze from Clayscapes pottery and you can buy it as a brushable formula or as a dip and pour formula. So that's why I say my chun blue glaze. It's a cone 5-6 glaze. It is food safe and it's perfectly fine to go in dishwashers and microwaves and all those things. But yeah, so I say my chun. I have six other glazes, six total glazes with clayscapes right now I should say. And I have two coming out in February so there'll be two new glazes coming out in just a few months of mine. So I'll have a total of eight glazes that you can get that I've used for decades in my own studio. So they've been tested thoroughly. All right, so we're just gonna keep wiping away. And look at that, if you look at the difference. Here we have just the solid color, that's fine. But look at this here. Look at how much the texture pops. You, know, you can see those waves and this pattern that I did is based on two things. We have a traditional textile pattern from Japan that was used in kimonos. That's this right here. And then the other is based on the Great Wave, which many of you are familiar with is a beautiful woodblock print. So we'll just turn it around. And so this has a very, um, Japanese feel to it because it is based on Japanese designs. That's, that's where I got these from when I drew them. So I went with a square form, which is often found in Japanese pottery. And I'm gonna do a black and maybe white or a black and maybe blue. We'll see, I haven't decided yet. Kinda want some color on it. I might do black and fog. What do you guys think of that? The fog would be that beautiful dark gray with black. So it would be subtle, but very beautiful. So if you guys have suggestions what you think I should glaze it, share them with me. 
and uh, you'll see when I take out the kiln. The last of the Christmas gifts are cooling right now. Oh, Brenda, you're ahead of me. I've got um, my mug and gnome person, by the way. Yeah, your pieces aren't done. They're, uh, I know it's the 15th, and I'll be sending anonymous messages to you because I don't want you to know. But your mug has been made for two weeks. It's just not dry. And my little gnomey is ready to go in the bisque, but I just got to get everything else together. So be patient. I promise it'll be worth the wait. All right, so now I'm just going to scrub the edge, and I think that's good. That's good right there. So I see folks asking about joining our ClayShare classes. You can go to ClayShare.com to sign up for those, or you can go to wherever you download apps, and you can download the ClayShare app and sign up through that. You can go to ClayShare.com and sign up and then get the app after, either way, and then just sign in through there. But, you know, we do have a lot of classes. ClayShare is in its fifth year of classes, um, online classes, and it's crazy the amount we have on there, and I'm, you know, always doing more. So what do you guys think for our glaze? Use clear and leave it black and white. Sheila thinks. Glacier blue, you love how it changes with underglaze. I don't have glacier, sadly. I did have it. I'll show you what happened to my glacier. Um, did I throw that away, Kev? My glacier bottle just shattered on me, and it was a terrible thing. So the water all leaked out of it slowly, and I kept finding, there it is. Um, I kept finding water on my floor, and I couldn't figure out what happened. Look at this. Can you all see what's happened there? See that? It's just completely punctured. So the glaze that's inside it is not just, I could put it in a different jar. I think I can reclaim it. So I'm going to try that, but I need a jar, and I don't have one yet. So that's on my list. But sadly, that's, that's what happened to that. Your mug won't dry either. Your recipient has a very patient mind. Yeah, I, I went... I, you know, the December challenge is something over the top or ornate. I totally embodied that. So um, I hope they, they'll understand. I'm sure I know they'll understand. It's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. So when you try to wipe back the underglaze on texture, you'll often accidentally remove the underglaze from the texture area. So how do you prevent that from happening? So let's talk about that. I have another one we can work on, and I'm going to answer your questions for two minutes, and then we got to go. Wasabi, Chun Blue, Natalie. I love you. <laughs> it's going to be so fab. You hope I hate it. <laughs> so when we're wiping back, we have a clean sponge. And we're going to take it, and we're going to press down and wipe back. And as I wipe back, I turn to a clean area. But then I move. And so I'm really skimming it. I don't know if, if you can see it this way. Skimming it more, not scrub, 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 scrub. Does that make sense? You can just brush along the top. And I've squeezed my sponge out quite a lot. You're not trying to put a lot of moisture back onto this piece, because if we put a lot of water on, it's going to soften up the underglaze. It's going to release from the clay. And then you're going to lose your color, right? Because you're, you're going to wipe it off. And so you just keep kind of turning and pulling and wiping it back. Does that help? So to be safe, elaborate on my history and connection with Japanese pottery. We want new people thinking I was appropriating Japanese culture. Absolutely not, no. So when I studied in college, my professors learned from a Japanese master. So that's where she studied pottery. So a lot of my traditions and techniques that I was taught, and I actually took classes with her master as well. I studied with him. He came to school and taught us um, whenever you know, if she had to take a vacation day or something, we were really, really lucky because he would come and would teach us. And so I am very, very lucky to have learned in North Carolina because I not only have the North Carolinian folk tradition of pottery as my background, I also have a very strong background in Japanese ceramics because of who I learned from. And so my pottery is very very like influenced by Asian ceramics and it always will be because those are my roots and who I learned from. Although I learned in North Carolina and not in Japan, I still learned under 
potters who are trained in the Japanese aesthetic of making pottery. And so that influences you as an artist. And it's a part of who we are. You know, he came here to America and studied here and you know, she learned from him and then she taught me and other students as well. And so as time goes on, his traditions were passed down to her, were passed down to me, and I passed them to you. And so they live and carry on and they get changed and altered through use and through people's interpretation. But yeah, cultural appropriation is an issue and we do have to be aware and conscious of it and careful about it. Uh, but that doesn't mean as an American, I'm limited to only using pottery traditions that were born here in America because many things came from other cultures and other countries. That's how art is. You know, we all learn from each other, we come together, we share, and we create new ideas and, and new processes, and this is how, how it all works. So that's where I learned. And, you know, I have changed my techniques over the years because that's what happens when you make pottery. I still look at my early works that I made many decades ago that I still love the shapes and the glaze colors and the process and the way they're fired. And I think sometimes I'll go back to that. You know, life is a circle. <laughs> and so I think sometimes that I'll, I'll end up back making very simple minimalist pottery. I don't know. We'll see. Life is long, <laughs> sometimes. All right, so here we have it, wiped back. And I'm just gonna get that edge right here. Yeah, I, I had a great experience learning pottery from many, many people over the years and uh, lots of different culture influences. All right, suggestions or normal. Your alumina hydrate sticking to the bottom of pots really shows your on your obsidian pieces. Doesn't sand off. So that's not really normal, Amy. It sounds like it's somehow bonding. So what I would do is take your alumina hydrate and I would mix it in some wax. A tablespoon of alumina hydrate to a pint of wax. If you don't want to do a full pint, you know, cut that ratio down and make a little container of it. Try that on the bottom of your pots and see if that helps. That might prevent it from sticking. Your mug, anything else? So Song Dynasty was the height of civilization at the time. Their pottery, the pottery of sophistication, you are so right, Jerry. Um, I studied that for many years and I do love, when I go to a museum, I always find that when they have a collection of pots from the Song Dynasty, it's a very quiet area of the museum, which I'm thankful for because I can spend time contemplating the beauty of those pieces, the beauty of the forms, the surface decoration, the glazes, it's breathtaking. I take so many photos of them. I get home and then I can relive the experience of being there. Uh, just, you know, it's really lovely to actually see those pieces in person. Actually, Christie's was doing an auction recently of Japanese and Chinese ceramics, and they had pieces from the Song Dynasty in the auction. And it was all I could do not to buy something. They were not cheap. I don't actually have the money. So what happens if you buy the piece and you don't have the money for the pottery, I guess? They, they break your kneecaps. They become, yeah, I don't know what would happen. But um, they didn't have any with Chun glaze. If they had, I think I would have lost it and just bought it and sold my car to pay for a little tiny bowl. It would have been worth it. I don't need a car. I can walk. It's an hour by car to the like, nearest town to buy like big shopping. So, I mean, I can walk 45 miles, it's fine, whatever. I get there in two days. I'll have that, that, that bowl in my house. <laughs> All right, so what GR pottery forms did I make the sectional tray out of? This was actually three different forms. I do have a class on this on Clayshare. It shows you exactly what you need for forms if you wanna make this. I believe I used the four by five, the five by five, and the four by five. So four by five, five by five, four by five. So it's that five, 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 five. So you can just, you can see them right here. Look, there they are. Cute, right? Oop, flip it over, clean up your back. Now I like to do a band of color on the back. Sometimes I'll use glaze, sometimes I'll use under glaze. It's up, it's up to you. Right, we've gone over, we always do that. We go over, it happens. 
It happens. Going over happens. You spent all day at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. Holy cow. Libby, I would love to do that. I have been to the Louvre three times, and I love that. I love the Musée d'Orsay in France, but the Louvre, forget it. I go, I, I, every time I go, I'm like, I I'm just love it. And the MFA in Boston has a really great collection, too. They have a lot of good Monet, and they have a lot of nice ceramics, too. So it's good. You've been having trouble with your posts sticking to the bottom of your shelf after your glaze fire. Should you kiln wash the tops of them? Yes, Teresa, kiln wash the top of your posts. I had some, if you saw my last glaze firing, I did not kiln wash them. And sometimes they do flux a bit and stick to those shelves. And when you lift it up, the post, luckily for me, it fell off and didn't hit a pot. But there's nothing more heartbreaking than you've done it, everything's finished, it's cooling, it's ready to be opened. You lift that shelf up and one of those big posts falls and shatters your beautiful tray or platter or mug or whatever you made. So yeah, use some kiln wash a little bit on the top and bottom of those posts and they shouldn't stick anymore. It should be good. All right, I think we're all cut, caught up. It would have been worth it to walk, I know. Um, Jerry, I don't think the auction ends till tomorrow, technically on Christie's. So I, I might be like, I give up all the Christmas presents for the rest of my life. <laughs> they, they actually had um, bracelets that were like 2,000 years old for $100. So a set of like stone carved, stone age bracelets, stone carved bracelets for like $100. I was like, that's cool. They weren't attractive at all. I mean, it just, it was like a, not nice. And I was like, I'm not going to buy that. But I was tempted because they were 2,000 years old. What am I going to do with that? Like, what do we do with those things? <laughs> the Garner, I love the Garner Museum. You cried in front of the sergeant. Oh, they have so much John Singer sergeant there. It's, it's beautiful. Um, the Boston MFA is a hidden gem. And I did my grad school in Boston. So I went to the MFA a lot. Like I would be at the MFA like, it's like, oh, where's Jess? Uh, she's at the museum again. So anyhow. All right, Clay Share News. Well, this new class that's going to be out, I think we're, we're going to put this out tomorrow. No, Friday. Kevin told me Friday because we still have to do the subtitles. And I didn't get them done yet. So the subtitles are the only thing left to be done. Those will get done tomorrow. And so we'll put it up Friday for you, but I teach you how to make the tray. And then I teach you how to glaze it. So we do the whole, na whole thing, the whole kit and caboodle. And we'll get that out to you Friday so you'll have something to do this weekend. Because I know you don't have like holiday plans, right? You're gonna make that, that beautiful tray. Um, next week, we'll be doing our veteran scholarship recipient announcements. And then in prime time, next week, we'll have our holiday party. Ah, Kevin will be over here on this side with me for that part. Next, in prime time, we're doing a luster using gold and using mother of pearl luster. Here's a piece I did a couple years ago that went, actually last year, that went to the clay studio. And um, this one is got mother of pearl and gold on it. And we'll talk about how you can use both in a piece. So. That is Major General Jeannie Levitt from the US Air Force. She is the first female fighter pilot. Pretty badass lady, I gotta say. As a fellow Air Force veteran, she would be on my, if I could, there's like a few of them, but she'd be on the top of the list of people you get to meet. She's on it. I'd probably faint if I met her. I don't think I could talk to her. I would probably be like, oh my God. And then I'd have to just, I couldn't even go up to her because she, yeah. Anyhow, we're going to do gold and mother of pearl luster next. All right, everyone, take care. Have a great week. See y'all later.